All right, introduction to Gabriel Marcel. Uh, good, so I'll start with biography. We'll see a little bit on his biography. And then, so that's number one, bio. Number two, we'll talk about his thought. I'll talk about two things. First of all, I'll talk about the disenchanted world and despair. And second, I'll talk about being and ontological exigence. And of course, we'll go over what all of these words mean <laughs> in a second. All right, good. So, um, so remember, we just finished Nietzsche, which means that um, as we continue until the end of the semester, I'll be responding to him periodically, right? And Marcel is going to be one of the main philosophers that I'm going to use to respond to Nietzsche in a way that I think Nietzsche would um, appreciate or be receptive to, right? Uh, bear in mind that all the philosophers now that we're going to do, Marcel, Levinas, um, Simon Weil, all of them are aware of Nietzsche. They've all read Nietzsche in school, right? Nietzsche is common knowledge <laughs> at the time. So they, as they're writing up their philosophies, right, as they're thinking about religion and God and so forth, they have Nietzsche in mind already, right? So it's no surprise that we can find some responses in their philosophies because they are thinking about Nietzsche. They've gone through the rite of passage that we've gone through and they are thinking about religion in a way that is aware of the Nietzschean critique, right? Okay, so Marcel, let me give you a few uh, words um, on his life. We have some information, and then we'll go into some of his main concepts, and then you will be let loose in his reading. So he was born in 1889, and he died in 1973. He's, uh, from now on, we'll be in France. <laughs> Marcel Levinas and Simone Weil are all from Paris. <laughs> so this is where our journey uh, ends, right, in the beautiful city of Paris. So he, he was born in a pretty um, wealthy family, upper class, um, but his mom died when he was four. And this is significant because something happened at that moment that will influence his philosophy. He tells about it much later, but he, he, he tells us that from the moment she died, he started to feel her presence, right? Even though he was so young, he had no memories of her, he had no memories of them being together, he felt her presence around him all the way until his adult life, right? So he, he actually writes about that uh, later on when he talks about the possibility of life after death, right? He's one of the rare philosophers with Plato who actually tackle the issue of life after death philosophically, who have the courage to actually go there, right? Most philosophers are pretty cautious, right? They stay within the confines of life. <laughs> but Marcel, along with Plato, who also wrote a book on the immortality of the soul, uh, Marcel is also interested in exploring the possibility Right? Of course, he can't prove it, but he can certainly philosophically make an argument for the possibility right? that there might be some kind of life after death. And for him, the experience of his mother's presence, right? even though, so it's not a memory, right? Some people might tell you just remembering her and this is a awakening happy feelings, right? He doesn't remember her. He just feels the presence as though she were there, right? This particular event is going to inform his philosophy. And we'll talk about it um, in a couple of weeks, right? He, when we talk about the notion of presence, which we'll get to. Okay, so his mother dies and he's raised basically by his father and his aunt. The house is, they are all agnostics, right? Nobody's religious including him. <laughs> so he's raised in a kind of very atheistic environment he ends up studying philosophy uh, and he becomes kind of, um, how shall I put it, a lighthouse for all of the budding philosophers uh, in Paris at the time. If you're familiar, he's writing probably around, let's see, 1889. He was, uh, yeah, so he's starting to write in, in the 40s. This is really when everybody, right, you have the, uh, uh, the movement of existentialism is starting to, let me write this down, right, is starting to, arise in France, right, led by uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, 
and other writers such as Camus, de Beauvoir, right? There's a whole community of philosophers. Uh, Levinas comes a bit later, we're going to study him. Simone Veil, she's on, in her own category, right? She didn't hang out with these guys. <laughs> but you had a whole community of philosophers at the time, hence the myth, right, of the Parisian philosopher sitting in front of his cafe, you know, smoking a cigarette, writing a book. This was really common thing <laughs> at the time, right? So, so he kind of, because he was a little older, he kind of became this kind of lighthouse. He would invite them to his house. Periodically, they would have these, you know, discussions. And he actually knew Camus and, and Sartre, uh, Sartre, however you guys say it in English. <laughs> and he actually criticized their philosophies. He's one of the rare philosophers who wasn't, um, what's, uh, Im not impressed, but, you know, mesmerized or, um, uh, under the spell of these guys, right? Camus and Sartre were very, very uh, well-known philosophical figures. Everybody admired them and kind of worshipped them. He was the only one who didn't fall under their spell. And he actually has some essays where he criticizes them in a very interesting, uh, incisive way that is almost like the way Nietzsche does it, right? So he has a kind of Nietzschean wit and intelligence, uh, Marcel. So if, you, uh, if any of you have read Sartre or Camus, you will want to study some of these criticisms by Marcel. So he ends up um, getting the, a degree in philosophy, starts to teach. Um, on the side, he's also a theater critic. So he goes to plays and he criticizes them. He also wrote plays right, and novels of his own. He wasn't just one of those academic philosophers. He wanted to reach the people with his ideas, so he wrote novels and plays. Um, and actually, to be honest, they're not that good. <laughs> it's better to read his hardcore philosophy like we're going to do. Um, anyway, so this went on until, of course, the war breaks out in um, 1933, I guess. <laughs> um, Right? Um, no, that's when Hitler came to power. 1940, <laughs> World War II. No, sorry, World War I. He was in World War I, I'm sorry. Yeah, World War I breaks out. And he, of course, he's of age, he's in his 20s. So he's drafted, uh, but he's drafted as a medic, not as a soldier. So he's working for the Red Cross, right? Um, so it's interesting because in, in his time as uh, working for the Red Cross, which was the medical corps, during the, the war, he actually had another experience which will inform his philosophy. And I'm going to tell you this experience because I'll draw on it later when we study the concept of hope in Marcel, right? So he, his job in the Red Cross was to basically bring the news to the families that their son had died. That was his job. When a soldier would die, he was given the belongings and he had to go hunt down the family, give back the belongings, give the bad news, right? So that was his job, but he noticed a pattern as he was doing it, that each time he would go to a family, they would react in a similar way, several families in a row, and, and all of them would have the same reaction of somehow believing that maybe, just maybe, they would see their son again, that it was all a big mistake, that there was somehow the son had escaped and was somewhere coming back, right? So in other words, the families kept on hoping even though they were given the uniform and the flag and so forth, there was this kind of uniform reaction. So it wasn't just one crazy family, right? Everybody that he met kind of had this, this reaction that maybe, maybe, just maybe he was still alive somehow, right? And so that's, so Marcel begins to reflect on this experience and we'll learn about it more when we study in a couple of weeks the concept of hope, right? Marcel is going to draw on this experience when he talks to us about hope. And we'll see more on that later. So uh, the war ends. Um, and he just, <clears throat> I think he continues, he goes back to teaching and so forth. Um, and writing, he begins to write quite a bit. <clears throat> and then interestingly, in his, um, I think it's in his 40s. Yeah, in his 40s. So he's basically written most of his works, including the text we're going to read. A friend of his, you know, uh, who's reading him, right, tells him, you know, there is a lot in common with what you're saying and Catholicism, right, Christianity. And Marcel is like, what do you mean? I don't know anything about Catholicism. I was raised an agnostic, right? And he says, well, you should check it out. 
So he goes, he starts going and, you know, goes to find the church and begins some discussions with the priest. And little by little, he realizes that the paths, his path, has somehow converged with some of the findings and teachings of Christianity. And you're going to see that, right, when we study him. So he actually takes this as a sign and he converts to Catholicism in the end of his life, in his 40s, right? Well, not in the end, but it, pretty much in the middle of his life, right? So, but everything he has written, right, of course, was from the standpoint of an agnostic, but it's interesting that somehow a lot of his findings, if you come from a Christian background, you will resonate because he, it sounds very close to a lot of the teachings of Christianity, right? Although he's using a philosophical language, a lot of what he's talking about is already present, in story form, <laughs> right, in the, in the context of Christianity. So we'll see more about that. Um, okay, so let's talk uh, a little bit about his, uh, about our text, right, and then um, a little bit about his thought in general. Okay. Um, all right, so two, uh, two points uh, I mentioned, the disenchanted world, right, and despair and then being an ontological exigence. And don't worry, I'm gonna define all of these words. <laughs> okay, disenchanted, what does this mean? It comes, it's from, from the word enchanted. What does enchanted mean? Like an enchanted forest, what does this mean? All the Disney lovers of the class. <laughs> what does enchanted mean? Let me see if you're still there. I haven't heard, I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> Not deep, uh, good, Suresh, magical. Right? Enchanted means there are spirits, there are ghosts, there's something mysterious going on, right? Um, so what does disenchanted mean? This means against, right? In uh, Latin, so not magical. Thank you, Suresh, right? So, so what Marcel is going to notice is what's been happening since the time of Nietzsche in the Western worldview. He calls it a disenchantment of the world. In other words, little by little, the world has lost, or people have lost, a sense of the sacred, a sense of the holy, a sense of the um, mysterious. Um, for they've replaced this, right, this kind of mystical sixth sense, right, they've replaced it with science, which explains everything, and which basically determines what exists and what doesn't exist, right? So little by little, he notices that, um, Everything that used to be mysterious and a little bit mystical, people are shedding that. People are not interested in that anymore, right? This is, uh, we know that from, I think we studied together modernity with Nietzsche, right? We saw how little by little people are shedding religion. They don't want anything to do with it because first of all, they don't need it. They have science now. Science will solve everything. Sci science will save us, right? And also because people are increasingly suspicious of the church because of the abuses of the church, right? So, so little by little, right, especially in Europe, right? This is not so much here, but in Europe, people are starting to shed more and more all of this kind of uh, mystical view of the world, the kind of religious, um, mysterious um, uh, presence in the world, right? And they become more rational and all that they see now is data and fact. <laughs> right. And so, of course, Nietzsche predicted this, right? When Nietzsche said, remember, we studied when he said God is dead, right? He wasn't so much, you know, being a jerk <laughs> as predicting something that was happening, right? In Europe at the time, God was dying. People are not interested anymore. It's a secular mindset. So what Marcel is noticing is that with the death of God, right? the world has become disenchanted. We don't believe in miracles anymore. We don't believe in some kind of redemption. We don't believe in mystery. And so people in a way are sinking into this world that has no more enchantment. And for, for Marcel, this is the reason why so many people, even though we are so technologically advanced, this is the reason, says Marcel, why so many people are sinking into despair. Right? There's nothing left to enchant them. <laughs> There's nothing left to give them some kind of hope or joy or peace, right? It's all just work. <laughs> we have an expression in French. I'll teach it to you. Metro, boulot, dodo. Anybody know what that means? <laughs> Let's see if you can guess. 
<laughs> What's the first one? <laughs> Anybody knows what metro would mean in French? See, in English is the same. Almost, Wilkes. <laughs> The subway, metro, the metro. Don't we say the metro here? You guys don't use that word ever? Metro? Okay. What's boulot? Yeah, thank you, Cruz. Train, you got it. What's boulot? This one's a little harder. Boulot is work. And now dodo. Anybody know what that is? <laughs> uh, if you know Spanish, you should be able to... What's the word for sleep in Spanish? Somebody type it up in the chat. The verb for sleep, dormir, yeah. Same in French. And then the abbreviation dodo. So metro, boulot, dodo is like subway, work, sleep. Subway, work, sleep, right? This is where people are now, right? In the disenchanted world, there's nothing left to elevate them, to inspire them. It's just work, go, getting up, going to work, going to sleep, getting up, going to work, going to sleep. And people are sinking into despair in such a world where there's no more uh, sacred right? No more mystery. So Marcel is saying that the, the, the reason why so many people are despairing in Europe at the time, even though they're so comfortable, they have nice jobs, they, you know, they have nice houses, they have a job, they, they're despairing. Why? Right? They're despairing because the world has become disenchanted, because God is dead. There's nothing left to connect them to the mystery that surrounds us. And that's what Marcel proposes to solve despair, right? He says the only way to come out of despair is to reconnect ourselves to the mystery, which not only is all around us, but within us. Okay, let me say it again. I'll write it down in the chat, right? Only way out of despair is to reconnect with what Marcel calls the mystery, right, that not only surrounds us, but is within us. So it's interesting, right? If you're a Christian, you see right away what he's talking about, but he's an atheist when he's writing this, right? So he actually has this kind of intuition that there's something more, right? From an agnostic perspective, he can sense there is more to life than just what I see, what I do. There is something mysterious, right, that surrounds us and that is within me, that I sense within me. And he's saying the the reason we are despairing as a civilization is that we have lost this connection with what he calls mystery or another word for mystery right synonym in marcel is being right our deeper being right we have our lives and then we have our deeper life being right with a capital b um okay so that's the issue here so the key for marcel of course to get out of the despair right and remember, we are dealing with the problem of evil, right? So the only way to rise out of this deep existential suffering that is despair is to reconnect with this dimension. Now, we'll talk much later in class how to do that. But for now, we have to make the argument, because remember, Marcel is doing philosophy. He's not doing theology. He's doing philosophy. We have to make an argument for the, the reality of such a dimension. And that is really what Marcel will, will consecrate his time for, right? Because remember, Nietzsche is not far from his, right? Nietzsche is nearby, sitting on his shoulder. And Nietzsche, if Marcel starts to say, ah, there is a mystery that we need to connect to, Nietzsche is going to be like, oh, here we go again, <laughs> right? What's Nietzsche going to say? Let someone tell me, what would Nietzsche say to what Marcel just said? There's a mystery within us, outside of us, that we need to connect to. What is Nietzsche already complaining about right now? Somebody tell me, see if you remember Nietzsche. <laughs> uh, what do you mean, Suresh? Explain to us a little bit what you mean by what you, what you wrote. We discussed in previous classes that Nietzsche Although people were making stories back then about how there was a higher power and a higher being, Nietzsche, of course, refuted that. So if anyone says anything that relates to Christianity or with God, they're, as I said, they're thinking too much like God. Exactly, right? Uh, and yes, Subokmulova, right? You desire it so much, you create it. So even though Marcel's not talking about God, he's still talking about a dimension that Nietzsche is like, oh, yes, that would be nice. Of course, you made it up, didn't you? <laughs> right? Nietzsche would say, that's great. I love what you said about there being a dimension of mystery. Now prove it to me. Prove me that this is not a figment of your 
a sick imagination, right? That you're projecting this dimension to feel less hopeless, right? So remember, throughout the next few weeks, we're going to be constantly in dialogue with Nietzsche. So Nietzsche should be on your shoulder right now, like a little uh, gargoyle. Um, gargoyle, sorry. Look it up. <laughs> and then tell me what it means. <laughs> Right? This is a good expression for Nietzsche as the way he will accompany us, like a little gargoyle. What's a gargoyle? Any... <laughs> See if you know. Look it up, guys. What's a gargoyle? <laughs> it's a little goblin, yes. And where are these little goblins found usually? In, um, they're found on certain buildings. Yes, anybody has gone to one of these uh, big cathedrals. We have a big one in Manhattan. They would paint these little goblins, these little uh, demon looking figures, right? Um, there's little demons actually sculpted on these big cathedrals um, as a way to maybe protect the cathedral. I don't know, but it's a little demon sitting on your shoulder, right? So a little goblin. So this is almost Halloween. So you can think of Nietzsche like that. So Nietzsche is saying to Marcel, oh, that's very nice. Dimension of mystery. I like it, but proof, right? So most of Marcel's work and job uh, and challenge will be to actually prove to us that this dimension actually exists. So this is actually the first time that a philosopher takes this, the time to do this, right? Somebody like Plato just says that it exists. Most people just say, yeah, 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 there's a dimension like that. Marcel is one of the first philosophers to really make an argument. Now, I'm going to show you how he does it right now because it will be the same argument over and over again. <laughs> so make sure you listen very carefully now because this is the hardest part of the class. <laughs> Everybody with me? Put your hand in the screen. Okay. So the way he's going to argue for this, obviously he's not going to prove 100% it exists because we're not in science here. We're in philosophy, right? So we don't have a, a microscope and ah, there's mystery, right? No, we can't do that. So he's going to prove that the possibility is, exists. That's all. He's just going to say, I'm going to prove to you that this is a, a serious possibility. We can't prove if it's real, but we can certainly uh, see it as a serious possibility. So that's what he's going to do. So the way he's going to do that is, is work from our own experience. Um, basically, he's going to say um, that we have certain feelings in this life. And for him, feelings actually should be taken seriously. Feelings tell us something about reality. Okay, so let's stop on that briefly because he's going to use feelings to argue for uh, mystery. But first, let's talk a little bit about feelings in general, right? So we tend to think of feelings as just, oh, I have a bad day. Internally, I feel, you know, happy or sad. We don't tend to associate our feelings with something outside. But you, I think all the time, feelings are telling you something about the outside world. For example, if you're pissed, you come home from school and you're pissed, someone will ask you, why are you pissed? And you can point to something that happened at school. I'm angry because of this, or you're sad. Why are you sad? I'm sad because, you know, I just lost this person and I broke up here and, and so forth. Or why are you so happy? Oh, I'm happy because I got a good grade, right? So our feelings talk about, they point to, reality. We use the expression in philosophy that feelings are intentional. They point to a reality. That's what it means to be intentional, right? So feelings always say something about a reality, right? You don't have a feeling randomly. There's always a cause behind the feeling, right? Now, clear so, so far, so, so good? We are clear so far? Everybody, hand on the screen. You see how feelings, okay. Great. Now, Marcel is going to say there are certain feelings that when you try to find a cause in reality, you don't find. And so that's where he says, therefore, because feelings always point to reality, probably they're pointing to a deeper layer of reality than what we just see. Okay, let me say that again. Let me write it down. This is the important pivot moment. So Marcel is observing that there are certain feelings that don't have a, or don't seem to have a cause, right, in reality. And I'll, we'll talk about that in a second, right? There's nothing that is causing this when you look in reality, and yet you have the feeling. Now, because we know already that feelings always are caused by reality, are caused by something outside of me, right? Therefore, says Marcel, 
these particular feelings uh, must be caused by a deeper uh, layer of reality, right? And that deeper layer, he calls it being or mystery. Okay, so let me, let me say it again um, so that you really get it. I put it all in the chat, right? So he says certain feelings don't seem to have a cause in reality. We're feeling, and we're going to talk about that. I'll give you an example in a second. And so now, because according to Marcel, feelings are always, they always have a cause, then we have to seek the cause in a deeper layer of reality. There is something causing the feeling that is occurring on a deeper level of reality. Let me give you an example right now so you can see. It's not the, the ones we'll study later, but it's another example that Marcel gives. And this is called, he calls it the feeling of ontological exigence, which will I need to translate. <laughs> um, before I translate, let me just describe. <laughs> okay, so he actually tells about this in one of his stories, one of his novels. He, in one of his novels, the character is a woman who is um, very wealthy. She would be the type living on the Upper East Side, right? Her husband has a great job. Her kids are perfect, right? They're doing great in school. Um, they have no pimples. <laughs> No, no problems. She has herself a job that she loves, right? She's not stuck at home. She has everything that anyone could long for, right? And yet this woman has the nerve, the audacity to feel dissatisfied. She feels something is missing, right? Now, this is a feeling a lot of us have, some of us, right, have experienced. Let me check a little bit with the class. How many of you have had this? Everything's going well. And yet you feel something in you is like missing. There's something missing. Okay, so not me too. I can relate, <laughs> right? This is what he's talking about, right? So then when you look into the reality, when you try to find the cause for that particular feeling, you see, no, there's a job, so that's fine. No, she has friends, that's fine. She has a good husband, that's, everything is fine. And so where is this feeling coming from? Marcel will say, well, this particular feeling is a longing for a deeper layer of reality. It's not a longing for what is on the surface, like a nice husband, a nice house, nice, this is all on the surface. This is a deeper longing, a longing for what Marcel calls a deeper level of being than just things, right? This is a longing for what Marcel calls being, right? Or you can translate a deeper layer, a deeper level of life, right? And so that's, so this is one of these feelings, right? Which uh, I would, we, we can call a metaphysical feeling. This is a feeling which points, right? To a metaphysical dimension. What does metaphysical mean? Let's review. What's metaphysical mean? If everyone is with me. Beyond the material, right? Absolutely. So the feeling, right? This feeling we're talking about that, you know, you, something is missing, even though everything is fine. Well, it's not a feeling for anything material because materially everything is fine. So it's a feeling that's pointing beyond the material. It's a metaphysical. Meta means beyond physical. It's a feeling that's pointing to a deeper layer of reality. It's a feeling, right? That's, I'll write it down. Metaphysical pointing to a deeper layer of reality. And Marcel will say pointing to what he calls being or ah, mystery. It's a longing for being or mystery. Okay, uh, are you catching what I'm saying? Is that clear for everybody? Any questions? Put your hand on the screen if you got me. Okay. So you're, you're seeing what I'm talking about, right? So, so this is, so, so that's what, so now just to look at the name of the feeling, ontological exigence, uh, let's translate ontological. Anybody know what this fancy word means? It's from the Greek ontos, which means what? Anybody know? Where's our Greek? Do we have a Greek in the class? <laughs> Sometimes I have a Greek in the class. No Greeks? No. <laughs> Anybody know what ontological means? Let's see if there's any philosophy majors. Okay, it's from the Greek word ontos, which means being. So ontological, pertaining to being. And now exigence, this is like Spanish. It's a French word, exigence, but it's like the Spanish exigencia. What does exigencia mean, Spanish speakers? Help us. Translate for us in the chat, exigencia. 
It's a need. Thank you, Alim. <laughs> it's an urgent need. Exigence in French means urgent need or longing, right? So now we can translate. Ontological exigence simply means an urgent need for being. That's the feeling that that woman is feeling. That's what we sometimes feel, right? When, we, when everything is fine and yet we're not feeling good, we're feeling dislocated, this is kind of not rooted, not grounded, even though everything is fine, what we're feeling at that moment is a metaphysical feeling which is, which is actually a longing for this deeper layer of reality, which is being, a longing for being, a longing for mystery, a longing for this deeper layer, right? Okay, so this is very important. This is how Marcel argues for this, right? This is the, the structure of his argument. He says, you see, we have feelings that are unexplained, and the best explanation is that they're pointing to something deeper, and therefore, possibly, being mystery are actual real dimensions and not just a figment of our imagination right let me write this conclusion right therefore right um well let me say it again these feelings um how did i say it? there is no better explain i can't write and talk at the same time um okay let me reiterate <laughs> Right, he's saying these feelings, um, there is no better explanation, right, for these feelings than there being this deeper cause, right? We can't explain these feelings any other way. And therefore, he says, possibly, right, so let me write this down, right, right? We cannot explain this feeling of ontological exigence any other way than appealing to this deeper dimension, right? Therefore, and this is key, possibly, right, this dimension might actually exist, be real, and not just a figment of our imagination. You seeing how he's actually beginning to respond to Nietzsche, right? He's actually now showing to Nietzsche, actually, I'm showing to you that this might be real. This dimension right, that Christianity talks about and that I'm talking about as a philosopher, this deeper dimension of mystery, of, of, you know, of something deeper might actually exist and not just be the product of a sick imagination. And the, the way I'm proving this is that there are some unexplainable feelings that can only be explained by appealing to this dimension. Okay, I've done the best to explain. Everybody understand who has questions? There should be a couple of questions that to clarify what I just said. That is a question. I have a question. Go ahead. Isn't it like Rumi said you feel it also? Thank you. <laughs> yes, the same thing, right? Rumi is talking also about feelings as being uh, what we can trust feelings, right? That the heart knows, right? When the heart is pure, of course, the heart has to be pure. But when the heart is pure and you sense, for example, the presence of God, you are actually feeling something real. Now, of course, Nietzsche is not talking about sensing the presence of God, but he's talking about a longing for some, this, a presence that we don't have immediately there. So he's a little, um, he, he's not speaking in religious terms, but it's the same idea that feelings can be taken seriously. Feelings have, uh, they know something. They, there is knowledge to be had or found in our feelings. Very good, uh, Subon Kulova. Nice connection. Very good. Any other questions before I, I just uh, conclude on or go a little further? Any other questions on anything I said? This is the moment. <laughs> if you don't, if you're not sure about this, you're going to die if you don't understand this good. <laughs> so make sure you get this down good in anything that needs to be clarified. Okay, so this is the main, one of the feelings, metaphysical feelings. There are three more that we'll talk about in the class. The first one we'll talk about is faith, the feeling of faith. The second one is the feeling of hope. And the last one is the feeling of presence. Let me introduce these three briefly, right? How many of you ever felt like you were fated to, for example, meet someone? Anybody ever had that, that you were meant to meet? Something happened in the stars that arranged a thing for you. 
this is the feeling of fate, right? This feeling, by the way, is a metaphysical feeling, right? You're, there is no evidence in reality that's, right? No one, no one put this together for you. You feel like something bigger put it together for you, right? Metaphysical feeling. The other feeling is the feeling of hope. Now, this feeling of hope, again, none of these feelings have any basis in reality. In other words, hope is not like you have some reason to be optimistic. There is no reason to hope, and yet, stupidly, you hope. Anybody had this experience? <laughs> that everything is lost, and yet here you are, somehow not feeling despair. Uh, put your hand if you've ever had this. This is a little more rare. Okay, a few of you, very nice. And then finally, this is also quite extraordinary. The feeling of presence is much more rare. This is the feeling you have only when somebody very close to you has died and this doesn't happen with whoever died that you don't know right this is somebody very close to you usually and you can actually feel their presence beyond even though they have departed you can feel their presence and their love even though they're so this is a little more rare i haven't felt this personally but has anyone in the class felt this this is much more rare okay couple one two okay very good so you guys will be our witnesses, right? I haven't felt it, but uh, we'll talk about this also. The feeling of the presence, which is a feeling, which again for Marcel, there's nothing in reality that supports this feeling. Therefore, there's gotta be something deeper, right? And we'll talk about that, right? So very exciting <laughs> journey we're about to take where we're going to really be trying to argue to Nietzsche, right? That this dimension is not a figment of our imagination. There, it could be real. And these feelings seem to be testifying to the reality of this dimension, which is, which people, some Christianity calls God, but you can call mystery or being like Marcel, right? Okay, I finished very quickly. I'm done way too early. <laughs> What am I going to say now? Okay. <laughs> I'm done. So any questions? <laughs> All right. Just a few words on Marcel's writing. You guys just want to go, don't you? <laughs> Here are a few words on the way Marcel writes so you don't have a shock, right? So up until now, up until Nietzsche, what you read, you could understand the words. With Marcel, this is over. <laughs> Right. Even though, to be honest, Marcel was trying to reach a popular audience, you're going to find that this is not the case. <laughs> right. It is difficult to read. And there are several reasons for that. First of all, for me, the main reason why he's so difficult to read is, is as follows, is that he is actually taking us on a kind of thought journey. In other words, he's just thinking out loud when he, he's not writing when he's thought it through and has introduction conclusion. He is taking us through his process. And so you're going to be meandering like a brain. You know how you sit and you think about one thing and then you think about that and then you go back to this and then, oh, what about this? And your brain kind of pops, right? Little uh, paths. This is how he writes. He writes like he thinks. So you'll be brought to an idea and be like, ooh, this is interesting. And now you're on the verge of figuring it out. And then poof, he goes in another direction and goes, ooh. And then so then I know you get excited about this. And then you're like, ah, ah, ah. And then he drops you and goes to another. He never goes far enough. It's incredibly frustrating. And no, Subban Kulova, he doesn't explain. He brings you to the verge of discovering something incredible and then drops you and you have to, and goes in another direction. It's almost as though he's saying, here's a direction, now you need to take the steps further, right? He's never going completely with us. In a way, we have to make the decision to walk alone further on that path. So all he's doing is giving us some directions, but then it's up to us to actually make the journey. A lot of what he's talking about, and this is another component of existentialist thought, a lot of what he's talking about, you can only know if you've experienced it, right? So when he's giving you a path, he, he's not gonna explain it to you. You have to walk that path all the way to the end to understand 
what he's alluding to, right? This is typical of existentialist thought, right? Let me write this down. Um, existentialist thought, right? Which is what Marcel is, how he's thinking, right? You can only understand certain ideas, right? By experiencing them. Right? For example, this notion that we just talked about, ontological exigence, if you haven't experienced this, you don't know what I'm talking about, <laughs> right? So the, these are, and likewise, when we'll be talking about fate and hope and uh, presence, if you haven't experienced these or open yourself to experiencing these, you're not going to get it, right? A lot of what Marcel talks about is are simply invitations to experience. He's not going to describe it to you. He's not going to give you a big description. He's going to say, here, here's a direction you need to explore. And here's another direction you need to explore. And the only way you'll know anything about it is if you actually experience it. So it's a frustrating, right? Because he's meandering. He goes here, doesn't finish, goes there, doesn't finish. You're left hanging. Why? Because you actually have to continue the journey alone, right? Uh, and explore this on your own, existentially, not in your thought, in your life, in your experience. So, so it's quite difficult. Um, another reason why he's difficult, poss I think this is the main reason, but another reason, no, this is the main reason. <laughs> I think that's the main reason he doesn't uh, develop his ideas. He just, it's like he's thinking out loud. Oh, this is a cool, interesting idea. Let me go here. Oh, here is another one. He never, you have to actually read everything he wrote to start to gather similar thoughts on a particular idea. For example, hope, if you want to understand hope, not enough to read the text we're going to read. You have to read everything he wrote and each time he talks about hope, jot it down and then you can begin to form a picture of what he means. So you actually would have to read the whole thing to understand each individual concept. He never spends like a whole chapter and really gets it all out, right? He will say little things here and there scattered throughout his works. And so you actually have to read everything and gather all the little scattered ideas together, hope, faith, <laughs> presence, and then you start to get a clearer view, which will never be completely clear until you actually experience it. So, so don't worry, he's difficult. Um, I find him difficult. I have trouble also with him. So don't worry if you find yourself clueless, just do the reading assignment, relax, enjoy right? Do what you can. I don't care what you write. Nothing is wrong. <laughs> uh, and know that I'm also struggling with the text. But you're not the only one. <laughs> okay, any questions on anything I said? All right, so we're good. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's it, right? Wait, what are we doing? We're on, we're Tuesday, so Thursday we're going to start, right? I'm looking at the syllabus. Um, yes, Thursday we're going to start Marcel, so you have a reading assignment, and then next week, and then we will be preparing for our next test. All right, guys, I am done. We'll stop the recording.